like to welcome um, Professor Jonathan Tenney to um, give his paper and um, Professor Tenney from University of Cambridge, um, welcome very much. And um, we're looking forward to your paper on the text from Kassite Ur. So first challenge um, to um, launch your PowerPoint. Thank you. Give me one moment. As many colleagues before me, I would like to thank the organizers of this colloquium, in particular Ali Khader for the day of operations of this digital platform, and Nicholas Postgate for the initial invitation. Like them, I would also acknowledge the contributions of Leonard Woolley, one of the true giants of Mesopotamian studies. But there are other people that are often overlooked who without their contributions, our knowledge of Ur would also not exist. Here, I'd like to first recognize T.C. Mitchell of the British Museum, who revised, edited, and eventually made possible the publication of Woolley's Ur Excavations 8, which was only in manuscript form at the time of Woolley's death. Secondly, and more importantly, I would also like to recognize the Iraqi laborers who dug and carried the earth of Ur, learned the content, contours of its architecture, and thereby uncovered its past for us to study today. These people, almost always nameless and never famous, were just as important as any of the other people mentioned during the course of this symposium. And I'm just as an example, I'm just always awed at the sheer tonnage of earth moved over the course of these old imperial excavations. Now it's been 53 years since anyone has taken a regional look at the city of Ur during the period of the Kassite kings, the last having been done by Brinkman in 1969, and is the Kassite period in the period of Assyrian kings, which was a review of Ur Excavations 8. What the publications of Ur Excavations 8 and also the review by Brinkman made clear was that there were major there was a major reconstruction of many parts of the city of Ur under the Kassite kings. Brinkman was able to establish that most of these constructions happened during the reign of the great rebuilder, Kuragalzu I, exceptions perhaps being some residential structures and modifications. And Brinkman was also able to establish through texts from other places that Kassite royal interaction with the city may predate the construction of um, the work by um, Kuragalsu I, by the order of possibly several kings. He also made clear that Woolley used the term Kassite in the chronological sense in his book to cover Isin I in later dynasties, as well as that of the Kassite kings, but he noted that he applies it inconsistently. So one must be aware with my comments and anyone who's using Woolley that he's not using Kassite always in terms of the time when Ur fit under the rule of the Kassite kings. For example, he will occasionally mention something as late Kassite, and this can refer to post-Kassite kings, even tablets from the eighth and early seventh centuries. Since that time, much has changed in the last 53 years. There are many new possibilities for understanding very early Kassite Ur or the Kassite period in general. And just to briefly summarize them, our pottery typologies have been refined by Gash Armstrong and recently Calderbank. There have been new surveys or similar studies or similar sort of studies um, attempting to answer more questions about the geomorphology or the settlement area of Ur. Um, just one example would be the survey of Al Hamdani, who proposed that the population of Ur had fled or established themselves at the site of Tel Dehalia during Sealand I, and then perhaps returned to Ur during the Kassite period. One of his arguments, not to get into it too much, is that he notes that the central area of the site is about the same size as the Temenos of Ur. Again, 
new excavations, those by Stone, Zemansky, Otto, etc., including those of Tel Khyber, Campbell, Shepherdson, likewise, provide some opportunity or new information that may help us illuminate the early periods, the early Cassite, and by that I mean the earliest Cassite periods at Ur. Evidence in the last 50 years also includes stuff that provides us the possibility for understanding late Cassite society at Ur. And this mostly comes in the form of the publication of the UET text by Gurney. They tell us a number of different things, information about family concepts, family organization, legal forms, the connections to the Temple of Sin in Priests of Babylonia. And as Gurney had written, it gives us a really solid set of price comparisons of commodities from Ur. Also have a much better understanding of the value of Ur in studies of the Kassite period because it stands in what I think is stark contrast in terms of the robustness of the excavation to the other major southern cities that we talk about in the Kassite period, such as Uruk and Nippur. And this is, for the most part, due to the excavations of Wooly. With this review of past and present research complete, we can now attempt to present our current understanding of Ur. And here I'm relying on the works of others, both those in the past and those who've more recently contributed to it. First, we'll discuss building. The last real work prior to the Kassite period had been under Waradsin and Rimsin, around 350 years prior to the Kassite royal renewal. And according to all available royal inscriptions, it looks like it would not have been done in earnest again until Sin Balasu Ikbi around 600 BCE. Now there is clear evidence that by the early 14th century, Kuragalzu I built or rebuilt nearly every major building uncovered by Wooly. These activities are amply attested in brick and other inscriptions in the Sumerian language. Now here I'm just highlighting in green uh, the green squares, they roughly designate the areas on the Temenos that have been, that have, um, been worked on by Kuragalzu I. As Brinkman wrote, it seems that there's no clear evidence that Kuragalzu founded any new buildings. Clearly, the state of the religious architecture at this time was poor. Buildings are described um, as such with a common statement such as the old temple that had collapsed um, a long time ago. The primary verb used in these inscriptions to describe the reconstruction tells us similar things. This verb is to restore or to make new. Some of the inscriptions also state that the king consolidated the foundations of buildings. Wooly could also date construction by Kuragalzu by the building techniques and materials used for repairs, so that is, without having inscriptions on them. The bricks were of a particular size, and he, they, the workmen used a particular mud mortar most of the time, sometimes a bitumen mortar that had been used in this past. And the builders also tended to just put a baked brick facing over old walls and filled them with rubber. Oh, excuse me, rubble. Among those includes the Enun Ma, where he claims in inscriptions that it had collapsed. And he built it following the plan from early uh, constructions. Well, he also believed that Kuragalzu may have decorated one of his temples, perhaps the Enun Ma, with molded bricks bearing in high relief a design of human figures and flowing water similar to the temple of Kara Indash at Ur, excuse me, at Uruk, depicted here. The bricks in this design are not stamped, but are attributed to Kuragalzu because of their texture and dimensions. And um, it also seems that this may have happened at Nippur. Kuragalzu also 
did work on the Edublama. The Kuragalzu Kur one bricks were found in the walls and doorways of it. And this is another building that he claims to have been an ancient building which had been, which had been built long ago and had grown old. The reconstruction did leave more than a meter of the old walls standing and the remaining castite walls on top um, often brought the total preserved height to over two meters at the time of Wooly. There's even a preserved arch. Um, Kuragalsu then had the entire thing surrounded by a revetment so that the old wall sat about a meter above the previous courtyard. On this picture, um, I have attempted to point out or with a, I have attempted to illustrate on the plan what I think is the point of view of the photograph taken at left. I've done that with the red arrow. And then after hearing Nicholas's talk earlier today, I decided to also put a yellow box around his um, judiciary platform or suspected one. Ragalzu also rebuilt the Giparu, home of the Entu priestess. His new building apparently was a fair bit narrower than it was in the Larsa period, but still about the same length. One part of it, one section, remained roughly the same, but he turned about half of it into a series of residences surrounding a series of courtyards. And again, I've tried, I've attempted to use both blue and red arrows to give some sense of the direction in which the photographs at left were taken, or the direction on the plan. It is not clear if Kuragalzu I built on the ziggurat because of the thorough leveling of it in much later times, but there is a stamped Kuragalzu I brick in the rubbish in front of the stairway. The Kassites did restore the ziggurat terrace and added some reinforcing revetments with buttresses of baked brick. And he also, Kurg also, also added a series of rooms and chambers along three sides of the terrace, including what's often called the kitchen complex. Now, moving on, he seems to have also put together the Ningal temple and did other repairs as well. Um, it's in the recesses of this place that in recesses set by Kuragalzu, um, where his foundation tablets were deposited and but they were later usurped by and removed and replaced by inscribed discs of Sin Balasu Ikbi. These are just some of the more important of the religious buildings attributed to Kuragalzu the first or at least their reconstruction. But they are not the only ones. One could speak of the Ningish Zida temple as well. The northeast edge of the city, he built what appears to be a small fortress, which projects outside the city walls. And the attribution of Kuragalzu I to the construction of this house, of this building, is determined by the appearance of the bricks alone. There are no inscribed bricks denoting its maker. Following Kuragalzu and using Woolley's Cassite and late Cassite monikers, remember late Cassite could possibly be post Cassite, his excavations uncovered additional work. These included repaving or patching of the courts, adjoining the Edublama and the Nana court. The Temenos near the Ziggurat Terrace was replaced repaired no less than three times before the time of Sin Balasu Ikbi many centuries later. And the Ningish Zida temple is also completely rebuilt and the ground plan changed. We do not know who did this, but it happens before Sin Balasu Ikbi. A non-royal building in the Kassite or late Kassite period includes traces of building and house sites around the city. This includes some in the YC site, which is north northeast of the Nana court, where houses above levels dating to Kuragalzu were found, but that they were above levels of Kuragalzu and under the Temenos of Nebuchadnezzar I. 
in the AH site in the southeast of the city, new houses were built to replace those of the Larsa period, which themselves had been reused earlier in the Cassite period. Little of them are left, and that would be a consistent theme in uh, the investigations towards Cassite period residences in Ur, and it in fact is kind of a problem in southern Mesopotamian sites in general. So in 2006, after putting four new squares in and around, in and near the AH excavations of Woolley, Stone and Zemanski seemed to verify the same results as Woolley, that Cassite or early Neo-Babylonian remains consi consist of heavily eroded scraps of walls and intrusive pits filled with Cassite materials. At the EM site, over the Larsa remains, there were portions of several buildings, say residences. Two of them were better preserved. Woolley named them the Hill House and the High House. These houses have more secure, secure dates. We can set them to the 13th and 12th centuries because of the tablets and pottery that are associated with possibly contemporary levels of houses in the same neighborhood. The houses with tablets that are associated are, according to Woolley, meaningless fragments of walls, and we'll get to that in a moment. Hill House was high on a slope facing west, and it shared walls with the retaining walls of the terraces of the slope. It's poorly preserved. The bricks were baked and did stand up to 18 courses in places. It was built over a vaulted tomb. Didn't find much in it other than a grave and some beads in a jar. They mostly had mud floors. High House had bricks and rubble-filled walls, preserved at some places to 13 courses. The rooms in it were brick paved, and there was a vault underneath it that had been plundered. They found three other graves below other floors, some beads, some iron arrowheads. Other places with Cassite houses, probably rebuilt Larsa houses, and therefore earlier Cassite, include those along the town wall. Now I'll now turn our attention to the UET documents published by Gurney. The primary publication of Ur Cassite period tablets from this time is, as I said, Gurney. He published 72 texts from Ur, first in copy in UET 7, and again in MBTU, Middle Babylonian texts from Ur. A smattering of texts from or purportedly from Ur were published before Gurney wrote these in 1974 and 83. And the bricks and other non-tablet inscriptions were, of course, published by Gad and Lagrange in UET1. In his publications, Gurney makes it clear that of those texts where there is some evidence of provenience, the field catalog places them in Quiet Street, in house number four, excuse me, five, room four, and house seven, room 11. In all cases, they are described as from a high level. I've sort of attempted to highlight these rooms in brown. Later, Gurney points out that they refine their understanding of the field catalog, or at least the provenience. And it was understood that these were actually found in the nearly unmappable traces of buildings above these Larsa levels. Now, not all of the tablets within this um, collection um, fit together nicely. There are some that see, have very different prosopography. And we also know that one text, IM85519, which is a barley loan from the reign of Kashtiliashu IV, was not found here. The catalog says it was found in a trench near the Enunma. Now, these texts feature some, or have some really interesting features. First is the question of dating. And here I can make two points. Three of the texts contain what we call, what have been called double numbered year dates. And I've given you some examples on the screen. The other five of these are from Babylon and dur Kuragalzu. They date to the reigns of Adad Shuma Utsur, Milishipak, and Marduk Apla Idna, 
So all late casts like kings, which makes sense after you learn what I'm about to tell you. I'm not going to go into details of what these actually could possibly mean, but there is no exact answer or no ob um, established answer. But more importantly, to me at least, is the attested dates themselves. Nearly everything we can learn going forward in time from tablets of the later part of this period will come from tablets from Ur or Babylon. In fact, Ur is the site of the latest dated Kassite period tablet that has been fully published. Now, all that's preserved of the date is the name of the king. We don't have the actual year. But if you look at the figure that I'm giving you on the screen right now, what you'll notice is that the major collection of Kassite period tablets, that of Nippur, and many other important sites seems to end, uh, come to a, well, I wouldn't say end, but it peters out significantly after the conquest of southern Babylonia in the, under the reign of Kashtiliashu IV. But what one might notice is that a significant period, a significant number of tablets, or at least a significant number considering what we have of tablets post-dating this time, so the late Kassite period, come from Ur and Babylon. Here's another um, figure that may also illuminate that in other ways. Now, I don't think I have a pointer. You can see it here. But this is a table giving the numbers of tablets dated to year um, from what might, one might consider the Kassite period. This tells us a great deal. But for today's, today's purposes, I just want to point out the fact that there is a drop-off starting in the reign of Shagarakti Shuryash um, that drops off until, you know, nearly the, or close to the end of the reign of Kashtiliashu IV. Now, tablets continue to be, or we still have preserved tablets from those periods afterwards. And, you, and you'll notice that of the blue bars that follow, nearly all of those are tablets that come from Ur and a few from Babylon. So the point being that Ur plays a significant role in our understanding of um, society, economy, legal processes after the Assyrian interregnum. Most of the documents in the Ur corpus are what we would call business documents or more accurately legal texts. These include documents of contract for the purchase or sale of human beings, animals, resolutions of court cases, including those presenting witness testimony, a set of what we presume are documents laying out the stipulation of water ordeals. There are also several documents listing gifts and maintenance expenses and things we might call administrative. In terms of the contents of the text, a few of the themes that stand out to me are well, A, there's considerable importance of cows in the economy of Ur. Um, there's lots of documented sales of them. Another is the officials who sit in legal judgment or directly ju legal proceedings at Ur. Many of them are the sort of secular officials one expects in court cases, so Shaknus, Hazanus, judges, um, even the king in one case. But among these are a considerable number of religious figures or priests, in particular Shangus. There are priests of Ur who sit in judgment and who also send people to the river ordeal. In one case, several priests of Eridu stand in or decide a case in Eridu. And even the Entu high priestess um, gets someone out of prison and adjudicates a case. There's also the evidence of a transition or adoption of family names based on eponymous ancestors. It's been clear for a long time that there's a strong presence of family names in first millennium Babylonia. Recently, evidence for this transition has been found much earlier in the Kassite period. Brinkman, for example, has noted the use of certain occupational names as patronyms, therefore presaging changes seen later. This phenomenon is also visible in the text from Ur. 
First, some of the sons of Arad Ea appear there. These are people first noted by Lambert as one of the major scribal lineages or descent groups who serve in very high positions. Secondly, as Gurney noted in 1983, a high proportion of the texts, perhaps even the whole collection, appear to come from the archives of a single family, the sons of Dayanatu, and that this family was one of brewers, in particular brewers of the god Sin. His conclusion was based on the following, that eight men are said to be sons of Dayanatu, Three of these sons are also said to be brewers of Sin, the Sin Temple, or of the Akish Nugal. And 30 of the texts mention brewers of Sin who cannot be directly connected to the lineage of Dayanatu. And he concluded that since the texts mentioning these sons of Dayanatu cover a period of 62 years, that they were probably not all brothers at the same time, but were in fact members of a shared kin group. Just checking my time here. Because I wanted to tell you a little bit about what this group of brewers got up, got up to over this time. <sighs> that will focus on some of the more famous or better yet infamous members. I think I only have about a minute left, so I don't have much to say, uh, I don't have much time to talk about them. But as we can see, um, or if I was to summarize, I would say the members of their family were quite litigious and that they found themselves oftentimes in conflict with others over sales or purchases of things that they were unhappy with. And in true uh, Kassite period fashion, one of their solutions or an often used solution was to seize or imprison someone who was either a family member or a servant of the person who had upset them. We also find that several of these family members also find themselves on the opposite side of the law, themselves being imprisoned. And several of them also find themselves being subject to the water ordeal. And one of the more, I guess you could say, noteworthy ones, Abu Tabu, appears in, is a well-known cattle rustler and appears his cattle thieving operations, which occurred mostly later on in the Kassai period, the time of Arad Shuma Utsur, um, are recorded on four tablets. So this concludes my talk. I hope that I've conveyed some sense of the importance of Ur to our understanding of the Kassai period and made you aware of some of the scholars and scholarship who have contributed to this understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You certainly have, it, well, from my perspective, at least illuminated a whole new world of, of, um, of Ur. And um, I look forward to uh, future opportunities when we can hear more about Abu Tabu and um, his relations. Uh, uh, it sounds like an entire lecture there in its own right. So, yeah. But um, I'm sorry, time um, I cut you off there, but um, very grateful for your contribution. To Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed.